I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's such a beautiful evening. We're kind of competing with the weather, I think, but we have a great reason to be inside. Um, my name is Janine Culligan. I'm the director of the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum, and it's my honor to, to welcome you all here. Um, one thing, just if you will remember to silence your phones. Uh, we are um, recording this, so just so you, you're aware that we're this is uh, being recorded. Um, there's a number of people that I, I want to thank uh, before we get started and turn it over to Maggie. Um, first, I want to thank the museum staff. Uh, Janet Cardi, Laura Jane Ramsberg, Laura Carden, um, they always do such an amazing job and make the exhibitions look wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, also, I want to thank our amazing summer interns, uh, Priscilla Santiago Hernandez and Andre Favela. Uh, they were helping us out with so many different things, um, but mostly I want to thank Maggie, Maggie Karen Key. Uh, for her love of art and color and plants and her talent and the idea to create a somewhat immersive environment in the museum's main gallery. So thank you, Maggie. Um, also a big thank you to our lenders, Charlotte Russell, Armistead Lemon, and Calvin Stewart. Thanks so much for uh, letting us live with your paintings for a while. <laughs> um, we also acknowledge that uh, the exhibition, Maggie Karen Key, Foreseeable Past, and its related programs are sponsored in part by the city of Roanoke through the Roanoke Arts Council. So we always want to thank them for everything they do for us. Um, so Maggie will be talking about her work, her inspirations and process, I think. <laughs> I'm actually not sure what she's going to talk about. but um, So I'm just going to give you a really short uh, introduction here. So most of you know Maggie, but some of you may not. Um, Maggie Karen Key is an artist and muralist based in Roanoke, Virginia. She received her BA in studio art from Hollins University in 2017 and has been showing her work regionally since she graduated. Uh, Maggie has been included in group exhibitions at Olin Hall Galleries at Roanoke College, Art Space Gallery in Richmond, Virginia, and Charlotte Russell Contemporary in Raleigh, North Carolina. She's a muralist, completing private and public murals in the, in the region, uh, Treehouse Tavern, Walls That Unite in Grandin, Hustle Haven, Barrows Incorporated, Greenway Mural, Gatewood Rose Botanicals, The Carriage House, and many private clients. Uh, Maggie has been the recipient of the Art and Place Grant for Public Art Installation. Uh, and speaking of murals, for those of you interested in murals, uh, the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum and Hollins University are offering a mural workshop with Maggie on, cam on campus, uh, October 21st and 22nd. If you're interested, see me or any of the museum staff to sign up. And now please help give a warm Collins welcome for Maggie Parenti. <laughs> Thank you, Janine, so much for that introduction. And thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs> um, as Janine said, I attended Holland University. And um, so I'm not used to being on this side of the, of the room. <laughs> um, 2017 uh, in my day today feels like a really long time ago. But considering all the world and national events that have occurred since then, um, it really are it does seem like a long time because of that, but when I take a step back, um, it's six years is not very much time at all. When I look back over my work, it's changed a lot in that time. And tonight I thought I would talk about how I ended up with the visual language that's going on in the exhibition right now. Um, when I came to Hollins, the drawing and painting departments were, and I'm sure still are, focused on developing students' observational skills. This means that we're setting up still lives, we're getting live models, and going out into the landscape to draw and paint. This method of creating images really teaches you how to see what's in front of you and break down the visual elements that make up objects. For example, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to paint this tree, you learn to say, okay, there's a dark green shape, 
that kind of goes up and down a little bit. And then right next to it is this really light green shade and you put that down and you keep doing that and layering up those pieces of color until you step back and you see that you've painted a tree. So it's a way of painting naturalistically and engaging with the physicality of what's in front of you. And so as a student, I strove to paint this way and build these skills, but I had an internal pull to paint abstractly and I struggled for a little bit um, and eventually realized my issue was that all my painting and compositional skills were observation based and I needed to find a way to create non-representational work while looking at a physical object in front of me. So after some trial and error, I was sitting in my studio one day and pulled out of the drawer this paper towel that I had previously used to wipe off my paintbrushes. And I was saving it intentionally, although I didn't know for what. I thought it was prettier that I might use it again, and that day I decided to paint it. Although I wasn't really concerned with making it look like a paper towel. So you can see on the left, that's the photograph that I took of it. Um, and I could have painted it with the shadow on the wall, the crease marks, and the folded edges, but I just wasn't interested at that point in the physicality of it. I was focused on the colors within the forms and where they landed and the white background that became this invented void-like space. I had this idea for an immersive installation that I wanted to make for my senior project, but I didn't have the time, space, or resources to make that happen. I was thinking a lot about space and how it feels and how we can manipulate how a space feels. But at this point, the idea was still amorphous and not defined. So this paint rag painting idea is what I ran with and it turned into my body of work for the senior show, which if you ask any senior, it felt like the biggest deal in the whole world. <laughs> And like the initial experiments, these works are all from paint rags that I saved and chose to paint. And I focused on the elements within. The colorful shapes became like characters in their own little worlds. And once I left Holland's, I kept painting in this way as my predominant body of work. Most artists I know experiment and work in all kinds of styles and mediums on a regular basis, but this main, was my main focus. And the compositions got a little more interesting over time. The rags I chose had a lot less white space and more movement, more forms. And that void that was very present in the previous pieces had turned into a little more of a grounded space, more familiar and earthly and less alien. So a couple of years go by and I'm confronted or I'm presented with the opportunity to paint my first professional mural. Mm -hmm. I had wanted to paint I wanted to paint this mural in keeping with my body of work. And I was super lucky that these folks liked what I was doing and just let me do what I wanted. At this point, I was still relying heavily on my paint rags for shapes and colors. And due to both the nature of the materials and my skill levels, I knew I wasn't gonna be able to achieve the same blended, washy, almost fluffy effect that I was getting with oil paint on this exterior, con exterior concrete building with latex paint. I was confronted with the challenge of learning a new material without a whole lot of practice. So long story short, I decided to choose a paint rag, identify the shapes most important to the composition and simplify them down to single colors with hard edges. And that's how I ended up with work that looks like this. Now in hindsight, this doesn't look so different from that, um, but in 2019, it felt like a really big jump. Um, after I finished this project, I realized it wasn't just about how it looked as a big painting, but how it felt. The whole backyard where this was located behind a public house felt completely different now that this building was painted in bright colors and bouncing shapes. I was commissioned to paint this building a few months later, and I'm not sure if you can tell from the photo, but it is a much bigger building and the project was just bigger in general. So this like particular season of painting these two murals um, really solidified this new way of painting for me. 
It was kind of an uncomfortable internal space because I was so used to trying to recreate an image in front of me and um, justify why I placed a shape or color in a particular spot. But this kind of new way of painting for me um, forced me to engage in my ability to feel where something could or should go. Um, around this time, I was studying more in depth the work of Swedish artist Hilma of Klint, who was born in 1862 and began making her abstractions at the beginning of the 20th century. Her work deals very intimately with the occult. She and a group of her friends would gather <clears throat> in seance to connect with spirits, and Hilma herself acted as a medium, channeling these images and hundreds of others directly from a spirit she perceived. Her mystical work goes beyond the visual. It represents the unseen, the vibrations of the spirit of the world. This idea of giving visibility to the invisible building blocks of our universe was revolutionary for the time and place in which Hilma was doing it. And it has also had a large effect on how I see image making. I, around this time, I started collaging a lot, following a compulsion to cut shapes out of paper, um, which was also kind of a hard left turn for me. Um, I was making all of these small four inch by five inch collages. And initially I was looking at some of my paintings to find shapes to cut out, but pretty quickly I was just intuitively cutting, almost letting the scissors guide my hands and judging the balance of each shape. With the murals, I was very physically engaged in the work because of course they're larger than life paintings, but there's something equally physical about making small work. Instead of the energy being pushed outward, it's like intensely focused inward. So around this time, I was developing a body of work consisting of paintings and an installation for an exhibition coming up. I was still making these collages and I don't know if you can, well, I think you can see it in this photo. The two little collages um, were what I originally made. And then I decided for this work to go through and pick the collages I thought were best and blow them up in scale and paint them. Um, so at this point, I had really stepped into non-representational work and was relying entirely on intuition to choose which colors to put together, which shapes to cut out, et cetera. This body of work is very still, almost arrested in movement, or even like these forms within were never really moving at all. The void like space returned with so much empty background. It's like they could occupy somewhere unknown <laughs> in between. All of these were made during 2020 and I feel that they reflect the stillness of that year. I know my life was much slower during that time and the world felt much slower, even just in terms of less people driving around and folks not sitting in public places. All of us contain a lot of energy within and we affect the space around us. So when we're not present or we're in our homes, that greater universal energy goes down. I wasn't channeling any spiritual guides here, but I was getting more comfortable with the idea of painting something I can't see, painting the invisible. At the same time that I'm collaging and making these paintings, I was also experimenting materials to create an installation. I was working with the same installation concept that I mentioned um, that I had when I was a student and the, the details finally just came together for me to make it. These images show the final draft before I made the full thing. And these are all cut paper, tied together with fishing line and hanging from the ceiling. They were an extension of the collages, almost a larger ever-changing collage that we could all jump inside. I was making organic shapes and arranging them in a way that to me felt balanced and reflected a sense of peaceful energy, which was part of what the installation was about. I wanted people to walk through them and enter into almost a padded space, somewhere that existed outside of time and place creating a screen between us and everything else, encouraging inward focus.
the way the gallery was set up, the paintings and collages led into the hanging shapes. So it was almost like they jumped off the canvases and into the air. And this was another real shift in my work because I was thinking sculpturally and not just painterly. The paper itself is sort of two dimensional, but the way they were in space was entirely 3D. And I had also really leaned into working intuitively and creating shapes based on feeling and energy and not relying on visual observation to create images, rather something like kinetic observation. Julie Maretu is a contemporary artist who I first learned about in high school during an Art 21 video that we watched in art class, as I'm sure a lot of us have. I didn't really have a great concept of abstraction at that point in my life. And I remember the images in this video deeply impacted me, especially this part on the left, the video where she was making a painting so large she needed a lift to complete it. In this video, she says, quote, I will refrain from trying to explain what's going on in the paintings as much because they're not these kinds of rational descriptions or efforts to articulate something in that way. I'm not trying to spell out a story. I think you feel the painting and the reason you read the mark is because you also feel the mark, end quote. This idea of feeling marks that don't contain recognizable forms has influenced my work greatly and runs as an undercurrent in a lot of what I make. <clears throat> Around 2021, I started making these little colored pencil drawings. Um, well, it looks, it looks so big up there, but they're like this <laughs> big. Um, it started with this one on the left. It was a cold morning and I was doing that thought exercise where you think of a warm place and it helps you to warm up. And I was thinking about this specific restaurant in Guatemala that I had been to a couple of years prior, which had this open, had like three walls and one open wall. And the open wall was filled with like just two story tall plants. I mean, they were huge. Um, and they filled the whole space, except I could see some blue sky and some reflected sun off of a building behind them. And what I drew looked like what that scene feels like when I recall it. And so, like I said, it's just a three by five inch sketch. And I did what I had gotten used to doing, which is scaling it up and painting it really big in comparison. And I really resonated with how it turned out, I think, because when I stand in front of this painting, which you can see in the gallery, that's how big it is in my mind. Um, and so I kept making them. Um, I would identify a memory, drawing it small scale with colored pencils, and then the ones that felt successful to me I translated into large paintings. I had gotten to this place where I was working both observationally and intuitively. The abstraction wasn't purely invented because all of these works are from memories that I hold in my brain, but also the elements of the memories are broken down into colors and shapes that correspond with the way I feel about those memories. They are visual representations, not realisms. Our memories can be very unreliable, and so the endeavor to work from memory becomes an interesting and in some ways dynamic one. And because every time we recall a memory, we remember it even slightly differently than the time before, there is a level of intuition that is inherent in this process, I have found. Um, at this point, I had quite a few murals under my belt. And again, all of them were in line with the way I was painting. And so making murals has just become a part of my artistic practice. And even from that first one, they have completely changed the way I create shapes and make images and think about space. Even though murals are paintings on a surface, they're closer to sculpture than paintings because they're painted on a physical object, a wall with a certain amount of thickness, a building, a column. The mural changes that object once it's applied. 
and it changes the space around it. The energy and atmosphere is different after an artist spends time and tension and attention in a place like that. A painting on a canvas or a sub substrate of some kind is technically a three-dimensional object, but you know what goes on within that object happens within the four corners and it becomes its own world. But the mural becomes a sculpture. It responds to space. It lives in our physical world and is no longer flat. When I was installing the murals here in the gallery, it really solidified for me the difference between a mural painting and a painting on canvas. How the murals change the physical space, not just our visual re responses. The liveliness present in our natural world, represented in different forms in the gallery, can be felt when stepping into the room. The paintings in this body of work straddle multiple realities. I was really interested in taking a memory that exists within my personal internal life and translating it into something to be seen and experienced in this physical world, to document the memory as it existed in that moment in time in my brain before it had time to change again. In the same way that when you close your eyes and a thought will occupy your entire inner eye, so I wanted these paintings to feel immersive, both individually and as a whole. By extending the paint off the canvases and onto the wall, I'm creating a space where they all live together, almost a recreation of the emotional space they occupy within. Some have recognizable forms, mostly leaves and flowers in a couple of terracotta pots, and in others, the, su the suggestion of form is all but unrecognizable. Instead, the abstracted organic shapes invite you to feel what they mean. In the end, I'm led back to where I seem to always return, this question of what am I looking at and what am I feeling? Thank you. <laughs> Anybody has questions? Maggie, you have questions from the audience? Are there any questions for Maggie? Yeah. Uh, do you still create art that is like the representation, representational art that you started to make when you were at Holland that you've eventually migrated from? Yeah, um, I think it's important to keep those skills um, going. Like, in a sketchbook or just a painting here and there, I think they're really foundational to um, just making. And so, yes, I think it's, I definitely do still. Yes, I think so, Nida. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. You were painting the walls in the big exhibition. How did you go about it? Are you taking on it first and then go around? Yeah, so the, the museum staff installed the paintings. We had, well, we had an afternoon and we all kind of like were in there moving them around and we all together figured out where they should all go and they hung them. And then, yeah, I went in and painted around them and was just really careful. <laughs> um, I, thankfully, I can be pretty precise now. So, yeah, <laughs> I was prepared to cover them up, though, if I needed to. <laughs> Yeah. I think I really uh, respond to materials, like, um, and also a sense of compulsion, like with the cutting, with the collaging and cutting out shapes and with the colored pencils, the shift kind of came from like I felt a compulsion to to use them that day and then responding to the materials, how they work, how I can figure out, you know, ways to use them, um, that will shift, you know, the outcome. And then also sometimes it was situational with the murals. That was like an opportunity that 
I wanted and I had to use that material. And so I needed to shift what I was doing. I didn't have time to like, you know, figure out how, like develop a whole new way of painting, like or learning how to use latex paint in the way that I was using oil. So I had to like work within the skills I had. Yes. Do you have a specific like image or memory in mind when creating each painting, or do you go off feeling color? The the ones in here are all well, except for two. I mean, it's like a memory and a feeling. Some of the memories are so long ago that it's no longer clear visuals, but it becomes like kind of um like uh like the colors that are associated with that memory or the feeling. So it's a little bit of both. And there are a couple in there that are that are not memories that are feeling based. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so when you were making pieces where you started with small sketch or um, something that is really simple and then you blew it up to a bigger painting, um, I imagine that that transition was like multiple sessions in the studio. And I was just wondering. Like if you had a difficult time sometimes like recalling those same feelings from when you made the original piece or like the memories and like how you navigate it, like entering it in the studio and like calling that back. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes sometimes like working like working through a bad studio day, like you're not gonna necessarily infuse the painting with like the bad feeling that you have. Um, even though I feel like sometimes it does, you do think that's going to happen, you know? Um, but yeah, it wasn't, especially as I was in the process of, you know, I had already made the small thing. And when I went to paint the big thing, I was a little less concerned with maintaining that feeling the whole time because I had this thing to look at and to go back to, I had already recorded it. So as long as in the end, like by the time it was finished, and I was happy with it. Um, it still felt the same, you know, it was okay. And so coming and going, like, I don't know, you just kind of get used to it. I think like <laughs> some days are good, some days are bad. <laughs> yeah. But having that subject matter um, was important. Yeah. Anybody hear me? Oh, yes. Um, I think you have a very pleasing and defined color palette. Did it take you a long time to refine that, or was it something that you just went into it fell into it? I do feel like I fell into it. I mean, some of it has been, some of it's self-referential, like especially in the beginning, like I was using this like byproduct of the paintings that I had already made, you know? So, um, and then that kind of like devolved into these other colors I chose. Um, I don't know. I think maybe I'm just drawn to bright colors, um, but I haven't really thought about it as a a palette necessarily. Although I do think it's um, kind of like a nat like a tropical natural world palette because um, I do have a strong connection to plants and uh, nature, and and that I think works its way in. <laughs> Um, if someone were interested in commissioning your art or buying your art, what would be the best way to, to reach them and inspire it? <laughs> you could, <laughs> you, could um, you could email me or go to my website. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi. So I've seen your major speaker studio today which is a big deal, right? <laughs> and comes with a lot of excitement and anxiety. Do you feel like looking back on that, thinking about that day, like are there insights you wish you had known then or that you want to share with them? Um, I don't know. Good question. I know, what a, that was such an exciting day. Congratulations, anyone, anyone who's a senior, if you're in here. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think um, just, yeah, don't be afraid to mess stuff up because you're going to make a lot of bad stuff. I make bad stuff every single day. It's terrible. It's so bad. And it's just going to happen forever. <laughs> you can't make good art without bad art too. So yeah, just don't worry about messing stuff up. And that's my biggest piece of advice. Don't be Thanks. precious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question about based on your memories and feelings and how they translate into your art. 
So do you have kind of the vision of the shapes already in your mind's eye that's just going straight into the art? Or like, are you kind of, like, is it fuzzy at first when it gets onto the page and then maybe you add rounded corners or points later? It totally depends. Um, sometimes, like, especially when putting a composition together, I, you know, I can say like, oh, this really needs like this right here. And I already know that. But then sometimes, like, if you step away and come back, I might say like, oh, that's not working. Like, I need to change it. Or um, with the cut paper, it was, I never had an, like a shape in mind. It was always like, all right, like, what's going to happen now? And I'd be like, oh, okay, this, this is it. So yeah, it definitely depended. Okay. Um, with your, uh, when you change mediums and try new things, do you find that like affects back on um, past mediums that you've used and like the changes how you see that? Yeah, I do. I think, um, I do think that like everything you do contributes to what you do. And so um, I think that like sometimes working with you know, working with acrylic paint, when I go back to oil paint, I'm, I'm using a different, oh, sorry, I'm using it differently. Um, and I, uh, I don't know, it's like I learned like, like kind of like with different mediums, like, and you develop different skills and then you go back to something you did before. Um, there's this sense of like, I don't know, like uh, you're using your hands more and so you have more dexterity, but then also you, broadened your sense of of um like how to make right and so you it's like you're building on that so I think yeah it becomes like a built thing do you have any new project ideas coming up or what's after this um well the 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 next thing that I'm focused on is the the mural workshop for um here and then I think we also talked about doing another mural on campus. So that's my immediate focus. I'm excited about those. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. Um, I think the world out there is so different from <laughs> from college <laughs> or any university setting. I I mean I think it depends on what spaces you put yourself in. But um, yeah, I think a big thing is um, there's not a lot of spaces for feedback out there. Whereas you constantly get it here with your professors, they're giving you, you know, suggestions and things to do and people to look at. And I think when you leave, you really have to do a lot of that work on your own. And then also the structure that's built in um, is pretty big. Like you know, here, I mean, Elise can tell you to go in your studio all the time, but um, out there, no one's telling you to do that. So <laughs> there is some independence that I think is built up. I think that was, I mean, I didn't think about it before I graduated. Um, and also I think you're introduced to a lot of work here that's outside of your interests. So you have a broader um, scope of like work that maybe you wouldn't have found on your own. And I think you have to work more to, to find that out there too. Anybody else? Yes. Hey Maggie. Hey. I think it's interesting how you talk about the way you paint your memories and feelings and how that's always something that's changing and it's beautiful. I'm curious, have you ever tried painting other people's memories and feelings? No. <laughs> it happens, but I love that idea. Um, I think that would be a really cool um, yeah, way to like focus on communication in a way. Like, how, how do you? Sorry. Or alternative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, how do you? Yeah, I haven't tried that. I tend, I obviously, I tend to be kind of self referential in my work. So I think that would be really interesting. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh. Um, you mentioned one of your trips and some of your work and how that inspired your work. And um, and I know that you've been on more trips, so I'd love to know for those of us who like to travel or travel, how does that affect your work? What do you like to bring? What do you like to look for when you're there um, and leave at home? Um, I always bring um, like a sketchbook and watercolor or pencils, something to sketch with. Um, and I do usually try to 
like make dedicated time to sit and draw while I'm traveling. But sometimes it's almost, I don't know, like sometimes I can't see something unless I'm drawing it and really spend time with it. So I really like to have that option and experiencing new places has such a effect on, I mean, on everybody when you go somewhere, like, um, but so I do like to have like some kind of record, but there's also, sometimes I feel like it's just nice to experience it. Like I've, I've had moments where I'm like, like I have to sketch every day on this trip. And it's like, I don't know, maybe I don't have to <laughs> just enjoy it. So, but I do like to have the option. Yeah. And sometimes um, what I end up drawing, like is not what ends up being the most impactful about a trip. Um, it's maybe not the memory that's the most, so kind of depends. Anybody else? Well, thank you again, Maggie. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Join us. We have a reception out in the first floor hallway, the museum is open till 8 p.m. And also, if I can just do a plug for upcoming shows, um, and always check our website and Instagram and Facebook page. Um, on September 14th, we've got uh, a talk with, with uh, three Cuban artists that are actually coming over from Cuba. They just got their visas. Um, that's uh, September 14th at 6 p.m. We'll have a show of their work. And then on September 28th, we'll have a gallery talk and reception with Gina Lowney and Stanley, uh, whose show we just did a silent opening for today. So please join us and check out uh, what we're doing in the future. So, and thank you again, Maggie. Thank you. <laughs>